You are watching the recap of the third episode of Research Insights Live. Hi there and welcome to this episode of Research Insights Live about the unseen faces of COVID-19. And with unseen faces, on the one hand, we mean unseen aspects that we don't think about a lot so around climate, around water, inequality, education. But we also really mean just faces, human faces. You wake up every day, you see your own face in the mirror, every time the same face. What has the experience been like the last two years for people waking up in whole other uh, parts of the world? And today is inspired by this new book. It's called COVID-19 and International Development, edited by Eliseos Papirakis. When you were reflecting on the process of you know, putting together this book, a few facts stood out for Eliseos. We have a first one, and it says the pandemic added an estimated 150 million people living in extreme poverty. So this is not one unseen face, it's actually uh, 150 million unseen yeah. Uh, faces yeah. of new, uh, uh, new people in uh, the developing world who now be falling in extreme poverty as a result of the impacts of the COVID pandemic. And extreme poverty living under? Uh, less than $1.90 per day per person. Uh, before the beginning of the pandemic, we had approximately 800 million people globally okay. um, suffering from extreme poverty. Adding another 150 million, it's quite a large, it's quite it's a dramatic almost increase. a billion people. Let's look at your second one that you brought along. 20% of the population in low-income countries, so think, for example, many of these are located in sub-Saharan Africa, access basic hand-washing fac facilities, which we know is it's an important preventive uh, measure against uh, COVID. To put things into perspe perspective, the average distance that, uh, let's say, a woman somewhere in rural Africa in an underdeveloped place, because it's often women who have to walk long distances to collect water, is close to six kilometers. And sometimes, quite often, the, way, uh, the weight that the women need to um, um, basically bear on their heads mm -hmm. is as high as 20 kilos. Wow. The thing about 20 kilos is the weight of the suitcase we normally check in, right, just before we're about to fly. And the last fact that you found important to highlight is this one. For a young LGBTQ a person who lives within a conservative family or a conservative community, uh, being in a lockdown deprives you of the opportunity to finally get your uh, free breathing space yeah. and being able to feel comfortable within your skin. Yeah. So uh, it's not a simple incon inconvenience. It's uh, something that provides you your freedom. We are going to our first guest speaker. Hi, Anilia. Hello. Welcome. Calling in from LA. Anilia is an Indian American, a photographer, a dancer, a storyteller. The last two years she has been traveling uh, to document COVID relief programs. So Anilia, please share with us what you saw through your lens. So in the very beginning of the pandemic, I was hired by two NGOs called World Central Kitchen and CORE to photograph their COVID relief operations in communities around the world who had the least amount of social protection and were hardest hit by the virus. These are farm workers harvesting radishes in Central California. Many of them are undocumented, so they have no social protections at all, like health care or unemployment compensation, and getting COVID would have been disastrous for them and their families. Everyone was scared, but while the rest of us were sheltering in place safely at home, these were the people who were making it possible for us to keep food in our fridges while we sheltered in place, yet they weren't able to feed their own families. So these are tents on the sidewalk next to the highway in downtown Los Angeles, and they're home to about six people. And they all shared their stories with me of their dreams and talents, but structural racism was shutting them out of access to the most basic opportunities leaving them extremely vulnerable to catching the virus with no way to protect themselves. So here we are, I was sent to India during the deadly second wave when there were 200,000 new cases every day and 2,000 deaths being reported every day. In preparing to go, I was bracing myself to be met with grief and heaviness and acute trauma, but instead I was shocked to be met with joy and gratitude for life. And I was reminded of the power of the village, especially in times of crisis and how big the definition of family is in Indian culture. There was no one here who was left to fend for themselves. It was the same thing that struck me on the Navajo Nation, an indigenous reservation in the Southwest of the US. On March 17th, 2020, COVID arrived on the reservation and spread like wildfire. And it was targeting their elders who were the ones that held the language, the ceremonies and the ancient stories of the tribe. So they were at risk of, risk of losing their entire culture. 
But why was COVID spreading three times faster on the Navajo Nation than in the rest of the country? The short answer is generations of systemic exclusion from resources and forced poverty. 40% of the people are living under the federal poverty line, and typically three to four generations are living together in a single home, 35% of which of these homes don't have running water or electricity. But being on their land forced me to slow down and learn how to listen more deeply. I learned that in Navajo culture, your family is considered your wealth. And it was the first thing they all mentioned to me, that every action they now took was to protect their elders. It became clear to me that collective care is what's going to get us through this turning point in human history, this idea that the well-being of each person is the responsibility of the group. And I believe that the first step of collective care is to slow down and really see the person in front of you. Thank you, Nelia. That was beautiful. Not only the images, but also the words that you are putting in, in our systems, actually, to take forward. I would love to invite Professor Mansoub Mursha to the table as we go into our next topic uh, around COVID-19 and inequality. So the period from the First World War to the 1970s was a period, broadly speaking, and there might be some disagreement, of declining inequality and of periods of growth, but with redistribution. So the kind of huge inequalities which prevailed in the world prior to the First World War diminished. And since 1980, we've seen them coming back with a vengeance. Our economic system, let's just use one word, capitalism, mm -hmm. and, you know, our political system or the political system we aspire to, which we can broadly call democracy, mm -hmm. are no longer, you know, compatible with this high degree of right. inequality. You actually summarize it for us. Capitalism and democracy become strange bedfellows if there's too much plutocracy. This is government for the rich, by the rich, and of the rich. The systems of policy making have become something which is driven entirely by the interests of the rich or the large corporations. And that's been driving the rise in inequalities. This might be a crossroad, but the initial impact is greater inequality. Whether there is a a more long-term change, and we do see some movements in that direction. Yeah. People are more conscious of the inequality, so possibly there is some hope that, you know, people are more aware of plutocratic tendencies and are more prepared to fight it. Utara, are you here with us? Yes! You're the chief change maker at Buzz Women, and why it's so interesting to have you here is uh, you described your work as a democratizer and an equalizer. Yes, what we are giving women in rural areas uh, who are uh, right now suffering or who, are, who have been affected by inequality is an opportunity. That's the way we put it. So democratizing knowledge, democratizing uh, the access to opportunities is what we provide. And of course, we do that in five different aspects of life. Uh, we call it cash confidence, community, climate, and care. COVID has, in some aspects, deepened it more, but in some aspects, it has also uh, remedied it uh, in a lot of ways because of certain, uh, <clears throat> the way that digitization is now happening, the way that digital has been taken up by a lot of people who didn't have access to it because they were forced to do it because of the pandemic. So I think there has been a good and bad side to it. Culturally in India, we always believe that there is always good and evil around, good and bad around. Uh, the proportion varies and that's when we have these disequilibriums and then it comes back to the equilibrium. Women don't have, uh, they cannot come out of their households uh, too often because of farm, animals, taking care of the children, the family, everything falls on them, the responsibilities. So what we believe is that we have to go to their doorstep. That's how we are tackling inequality. We're going to travel to a new theme, a new continent. We're going to speak about COVID-19 and education. For the last six months, Zohar and Carla have been teaching an entire country on TV. Esperamos pronto vernos en los salones de clase. 
tratamos de que todos tengan acceso en cuanto al contenido de, de lo que hacemos. Existen variedad de este, medios en donde pueden encontrar estos programas en internet, en la televisión, en el radio. Estamos muy preocupadas por nuestros niños que no tienen acceso. Muchas de las cosas que ustedes van a hacer para iniciar el ciclo escolar es la educación del futuro. A third of Mexican children have no idea what this future looks like. Lucy is seven. Extraño mi salón, extraño mis pues la sigue, extraño mi, mis maestros. The TV subscription is 10 euros a month. Lucy's parents buy it when they can, but then the electricity goes out. There was this wall, the digital divide which showed very clearly that some children could more or less learn things, uh, basic things, uh, the, the parents could help, they had access to Google immediately, they could manage. Mm -hmm. yeah? But then you had the vast majority of poorer children who had no access or that they were in families where their parents couldn't help or, well, uh, given the impossibility of going out to work, children also had to go back to work to help, to raise an income, to, to find ways of getting simple things like food and shelter. And this issue of getting access is, well, maybe there is only one smartphone in the family and there were all these uh, WhatsApp groups of parents, one per child, sending materials, please cover this chapter for tomorrow. And if you have one mobile phone or one laptop and, you know, two hours of, of, uh, uh, of minutes yeah, to, to connect, you need to choose who are you going to give access, access I mean technology, mm -hmm. to. So is it the one that is most clever? Is it the one that is older? Do you educate the girls? And in some places, educating the girls is less important than educating the boys, but the boys can work. And there were all these discussions about, yeah, who is more valuable? Which yeah. one of the children in the family should have access? And which one do we leave behind until the pandemic ends? Yeah. This is the outskirts of Santa Cruz. Everything that happens in this area happens through the school. So when we have to uh, go and ask bus companies to come to this area, it was organized through the school. Vaccination campaigns, whatever you can think of, it happens in the schools, through the schools. And what we'll see here is, well, nothing happening. It's an empty street. And I think this is one of the interesting phases of the hidden phases of the pandemic is that the communities have stopped getting together. Okay. One of the reasons that in many schools in Latin America persuades parents to send their children to school every day is that they get food. When schools closed, well, the children didn't have access for, as I said, almost two years in some places to this meal. And this is the other aspect that it, this is also Bolivia. In some places where there's a lot of violence in communities due to gang violence or drug related, the schools are very often the, the safe havens, the sanctuaries, where the stabbing stays outside the school, where rivalry between families stays outside the school, and the school is a safe, pla the safe place. And the safe place, the place where we could all feel safe, was closed. And you also have a song, actually, that tells a story. But maybe we have a little surprise for you here. Um, the song is called Caminando, and we actually have someone here in the room that can sing. And it's my dad. <laughs> One of the things that made me so proud of my dad is, is his voice. Are you guys ready? Yes? Okay, great. Caminando, caminando, y nunca pare, entre risa y dolores. Yeah, well done. Nice. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> In the Dominican Republic, we gave a ride to one of the teachers and he, he told us that he had been a student when he was a child and four hours of every day of his life were spent on walking to school. 
And they played this song on the radio, and, and he said, oh, this, this has a meaning to me. And, and I realized how important it is for so many children in Latin America that they walk two hours, maybe three hours, to go to school to learn to read and write. The strength of, of the faith they must have that school is going to get them a better life. I have a question to you, Georgina, from the audience. Was there any emergency initiatives from the government targeting poor families in this situation? Almost invariably insufficient. Uh, small subsidies to, especially in the first wave, in the beginning of the pandemic, but there were all sorts of difficulties in reaching the subsidies. So you had to meet certain conditions, you had to go to a certain place, and you had to fill in forms uh, digitally, which again, it traps us in the digital divide. But the last part is about climate and water. We will start again with a little fragment, this time from Zimbabwe, Harare, the capital city. And this gives a face to what Eliseus was sharing earlier about only 20% of people in low-income countries actually having access to hand-washing facilities in this time. <laughs> We are losing a lot of treated water along the system because the pipeline is aged. Around a third of our people are only accessing water and two thirds are not. And that's a dangerous situation. So we're back here with Eliseos and your colleague and friend, I believe, Matthias Rieger, also associate professor at ISS. Welcome, Matthias. Thank you, Lynn. And we also have joining us uh, from the African continent, from Kenya, Doris Ago. Hi, Doris. Hi. Doris, you are a consultant and researcher around climate and water. This is Thank actually you. our third continent calling in. I want to ask you, Matthias, uh, because you also contributed to the book, the chapter around water, and you very much focused on this aspect of child stunting. So let's all think back to the beginning of the pandemic. What do we do? We all started washing our hands uh, obsessively, buying hand sanitizers and um, piling up stocks of toilet paper. In many parts of uh, low-income countries, uh, people do not have access to safe drinking water, uh, safe ways to wash their hands and uh, safe sanitation. We know that there's a very strong link between um, unsafe wash conditions, that's water, sanitation and hygiene, and child stunting. What's child stunting and why is it bad? Well, that's when children are too short for their age. So they're, they're, when they're under the age of five, um, they get born and then their growth collapses and they're not reaching their um, anthropometric uh, potential, their height potential. Um, and that's going to have long-term consequences on them in terms of their well-being when they're adults, on their health when they're adults, but also the economic productivity. There's uh, strong evidence that they will have lower wages, for instance, and have also lower education outcomes. And so that um, really um, echoed with me during the beginning, especially of the pandemic. And it also shows that something that's not usually on our mind, you know, wash, water, sanitation, hygiene, that suddenly becomes on our mind is even important outside of the pandemic. Yeah. There's still about 150 million children, um, as we speak, are too short for the age, wow. uh, under five wow. years of age. Yeah. So it's also kind of a positive aspect that we're focusing more now on water and sanitation. Yeah. Like it might have positive effects or outcomes for, for the children. Yeah. So we have some more relationships here now, but I thought it was extremely fascinating how this all ties together. The link between, you know, the pressure on water, the climate crisis, food security, and this pandemic. Thanks, Lynn, for the introduction. So Matthias had an easier picture to describe. In this yes, one, you can see did. the arrows pointing in all directions. Very unequal. Which also, of course, shows how complex these interrelationships are. I think what's important to get out of this picture is that, although it might not be immediately visible, at least at first sight, uh, climate change, water security, and this pandemic and future pandemics are actually interlinked. They're all anthropogenically um, uh, induced, 
mediated, you amplified. You mean caused by humans? Exactly. So this is, of course, about uh, population growth. Uh, it's about um, increased and often ill-planned urbanization in many parts of the world. It's about deforestation. It's about inadequate uh, infrastructure. Governments are not spending enough on education, on uh, um, uh, green transformation, new technologies, and so on. And all these uh, human activities, of course, increase our contact with um, other species. They increase the spread of pathogens. But they're also responsible for global warming and, um, and water scarcity. Trade liberalization also is a large part of their story. Uh, we often think of trade specialization and globalization. Um, we often think of the more positive aspects of it. I mean, many of the things that we consume right, come from other countries. Things have become cheaper. Uh, there's a wider variety of consumer goods that we are consuming. But there are also many negative side effects. I think of the floriculture industry in Ethiopia and Kenya. Yeah. And as a, result of, as a result of this, of course, there has been a gradual depletion of aquifers, of water tables. Flowers means exactly. less Flowers water. Flowers need a lot of water. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. it also means that there is less room for conventional farming. Basically, you substitute your own domestic food with cheaper imported food. Yeah. And under no normal circumstances, that doesn't pose a risk to food security. Mm -hmm. But of course, these are not normal circumstances. When you have a pandemic that creates disruption to trade and the agricultural uh, supply chains, yeah. then the risks um, emerge. Yeah, exactly. And that creates, of course, problems for uh, food security. Yeah. Doris, I would like to ask you, how do you see these links play out in Kenya? What's important for us to see? Uh, I think there's some good news in Kenya in terms of wash and water. So the government commissioned uh, some boreholes. So for the first time, some communities who hadn't had water for a long time. But just to go to the linkages and the uh, linking the dots um, and uh, between um, COVID and climate. So I was very lucky to do some work in the rural areas as well as in urban areas during COVID. So one of the things was uh, the prolonged drought, which really affected like smallholder farmers. And so the majority are women in the rural areas. So you can imagine these women, uh, they were relying on water uh, for their crop production because they cannot afford irrigation. So that really affected them. So there was a big divide between the rural and the urban areas. Um, and I was very lucky to do some work with ILO, uh, the international labor organizations, how the COVID really influenced between rural and urban areas. So the rural areas, even though climate was affecting others, prolonged drought, they could actually still get water uh, because of you know, it's free in the rural areas, although they still spend a lot of time searching for water. But imagine in the, in the urban areas where you know businesses were really bad, uh, they couldn't get access to water. So it's really a huge divide uh, between in the rural and urban areas. You also looked up something interesting, and that is how much we spend on the pandemic or the consequences of COVID versus how much we spend on mitigating or adapting to climate? Within a very short period of time, right, governments around the world and international organizations managed to raise 8 trillion uh, US dollars right, for uh, mitigating the effects of COVID-19 as well as mitigating the spread of, of the virus. Now, if you compare this with how much we spent on uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation, that's basically um, uh, only one-tenth of these values, 800 billion US dollars. And that sends something about our perceptions on urgency. Exactly. Of issues. Uh, do you have any ideas on how we could you know, learn from, from how we've handled the pandemic and, and spend more on urgent issues like water management, climate, you know, make, make the urgency of that more felt maybe? Yeah, maybe a small thing from my point of view. I, I do a lot of work in behavioral uh, research. And what we see here is when the problems are very salient, you feel them, you're more likely to do something about it. And we've been all subjected to big experiments, governments nudging us to wear masks, nudging us to um, uh, wash our hands. 
And I think a lot of these uh, studies that, are, that have been done around the world on behavioral research might help us to get people also to care more about climate change and, yeah. and do the right thing when it comes to recycling and comes to you know saving energy and so forth. Do you I have any, any tips for the government on <laughs> how to well, move the uh, herd? One thing I think works well is yeah, this kind of peer pressure. Right. Um, so, you know, I've been washing more my hands because everyone around me is doing it. So kind of leveraging these peer effects. But how do you create peer pressure? Let's see. I don't know. I don't have all solutions. You're a behavioral economist, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, there's uh, there's some tricks, um, you know, but uh, it's not it's not straightforward. You're not going to. Uh, it's only for the behavioral economists uh, uh, to know. <laughs> 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 we will go to our last guest from our fourth continent. She's not very far away because I think she's calling in from The Hague. And, um, you know, this book and this entire event is meant to build bridges between the research that's being done in an institute like ISS with like, things we need to all know to inform our practice and, and policy as well. So we're very honored to be able to hand over the first copy of this book as we're launching it today right now uh, to Pascale Grotenhuis. Uh, Pascal is the Director of Social Development and Ambassador for Women's Rights and Gender Equality at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in the Netherlands. Uh, and we get to give her the first copy. She has it, yeah. We could like do a little quick. <laughs> <laughs> Very honored to have you here. Of course, you know, um, the question that we are, would all be eager to, um, um, to hear back from you is about what kind of co-synergies you can think that we can uh, create as researchers, policy makers, um, practitioners, other stakeholders in terms of solving problems of such global dimension. Thank you so much for having me. And I've been listening uh, to all the previous speakers actually from the beginning. There were many facts mentioned already and what I, also, I didn't hear it yet. But if you look at gender equality, for instance, Before COVID, it would take uh, 96 years to achieve gender parity in the world. But now it will take 136 years. And probably in a few years, when we really feel all the consequences of COVID on the budget of the health minister in Mozambique or in Burkina, on the, uh, the money allocation, on the resource allocation that's going into COVID instead of climate, um, I think the negative effects we will only feel in the years to come because it's it's not over yet. And already we see that we're so backtracking on achieving the SDGs, we will never make it in 2030. And I'm a really big optimist. So I think it's just terrifying actually to speak about this. Um, but it also signals that we need to do more and we need to do it together. I think that's the good thing about COVID. There's quite some valuable lessons from the COVID pandemic that you can achieve change. If there's a new strain in Denmark, it will affect the rest of the world. So I think we don't have to make the pitch anymore that it's a one interconnected world and we have interconnected problems. What you also see is because of COVID, you see actually a pushback against liberties of NGOs, of people, of uh, gender equality. So we also have to push back against the pushback, as I always say. It's English really awful. <laughs> um, but it's really needed. And we need all the players. We cannot exclude anyone because COVID, but also climate, affects us all. Well, we've come to the end. Thank you, everyone, tuning in from 34 countries. If you would like to actually read more, you can't get enough of, of these insights. You can go to the ISS website and look for the research insights section uh, where researchers of ISS share their latest, greatest findings. And as you fill out uh, your survey and, and share your thoughts with us, here's to unity, to solidarity, to collective care, and uh, to seeing you next time. <laughs>